Everybody calls him the Black Reaper. With his dark hair and eyes, every student at school thinks Kujo Kazuya is a character that has come to life. You see, the students at St. Marguerite Academy enjoy ghost stories. And one of the most prominent tales is titled, The Reaper That Comes in the Spring. Kujo's appearance fits the bill of the story's main character, and it just so happens he transferred there around spring. Kujo doesn't understand the hype around his appearance. He's just a simple boy, the third son of an imperial soldier, attending there as an exchange student. He comes from Japan, an ally of the country of Sovi where St. Marguerite is located. His homeroom teacher, Cecile Lafitte, is a different case. She seems to be more excited than wary about his appearance there. She suggests he go to the Lone Tower within the Academy grounds, which holds thousands and thousands of books on each level. There, Kujo may find his first true friend. Kujo is skeptical, but when he enters the building, he marvels at its enormity. He climbs up each level to browse the books. He ends up getting the one about the ghost stories that everyone talks about. There's one about a ghost ship that appears on stormy nights, another about a Leviathan alchemist that can produce gold from anything, and the most intriguing of all, the brilliant grey wolf that can speak human languages. Kujo is fascinated to know about these things. When he looks up, he sees something golden glinting down on him. He climbs up higher until he reaches the top. He doesn't expect to see a sprawling botanical, but it's there. It's comparable to the legends of the Garden of Eve. In the middle of the garden is a small girl sitting on the floor surrounded by her books. Her stillness reminds Kujo of a life-size doll. She has long, straight blonde hair, almost golden, and her eyes green. Her name is Victorique de Blois, and she's been waiting for him. She speaks mystically, saying he's been chosen to break her boredom. Thinking that he's gone mad after seeing a doll talk, Cujo flees the garden. But the next day, he keeps thinking about the girl. He's read a story about a golden fairy, and he can't help but compare the girl to that character. So, when the noon bell strikes, he comes back to the library tower. When he gets there, he sees Victorique rolling on the floor. He finds her mystical and weird. She finds him plain and boring. Just then, the sound of a lift coming up and its doors opening takes Cujo's attention. It turns out there's a lift mechanism that can be accessed to come up to the garden. Coming out of it is a man with the most elaborate and ridiculous pompadour Cujo has ever seen. He is Inspector Greville de Blois and he's there on a mission. But he doesn't expect to find another student hanging out with Victorique. Pretending to be flamboyant and eccentric, Greville addresses Cujo as Little Squirrel. But in truth, he needs to talk to Victorique about a mystery murder that needs her expertise to solve. A fortune teller named Roxanne was found dead in her mansion the other night. Roxanne was famous for her use of hares and hunting dogs to predict the future. The night of her demise, there was a reported sound of a gunshot ringing in the night. The other occupants of the house, an Indian manservant, an Arabic maid, and the Grand Doctor, all run up to Roxana's door to check on her. But it's locked. The manservant proposed to break down the door using an axe, but the granddaughter stopped him. If her grandmother was dead, then she'd inherit the mansion, and she wouldn't want to destroy any part of it. The maid ran to the next room and fetched a pistol. She came back, shouted something at Roxanne's door, then fired the gun through the keyhole. When they opened the door, they found the fortune teller, lifeless in her wheelchair, with a gunshot wound on her left eye. The window was locked and the murder weapon couldn't be found anywhere. Greville initially suspects the manservant as the culprit, since he was below the window of Roxanne's room at the time of the murder, putting the hares back in their cages. Victorique asks Greville why the manservant was Indian and the maid Arabic. Still addressing Cujo, he explains that Roxanne liked foreign helpers. She could speak Indian and Arabic fluently, but the servants could only speak their own language. With a yawn, Victorique brings out her ceramic pipe and puts it in her mouth. She says she's ready to reconstruct the fragments from the chaos of this world, which simply means she solved the mystery. She says the culprit is the Arabic maid, not the Indian manservant. She explains that the maid knew Roxanne was still alive after the first gunshot. Since the fortune teller was the only one who could speak Arabic, the maid tricked her into moving closer to the door. Roxanne unfortunately peeked through the keyhole with her left eye, at the same time the maid fired through it. 
She tells Greville to look for bullet marks in the next room, as it's certain the maid created that first gunshot to frighten Roxanne and gather everyone in the mansion. As for the motive, she advises Greville to look for something the maid has hidden. And with that, she solves the crime, and Greville leaves. Cujo marvels at Victorique's intelligence. It's his first time meeting someone who looks collected as she solves a crime. The next day, Cujo discovers that Greville has taken all the credit for solving the mystery and even getting a luxury yacht from Roxanne's granddaughter. Indignant, he storms into Greville's office and demands compensation for Victorique. It looks like the inspector has always taken credit for solving mysteries. However, it doesn't mean that Greville is a bad guy. Perhaps no one knows about Victorique's presence, and the public simply sees Greville as a shrewd inspector with a pompadour. To lessen Cujo's indignant feelings, he invites the two to his yacht over the weekend. He says something that makes Cujo curious. Victorique is not allowed to leave the premises of the school without his permission. Cujo comes back to the library tower and informs the girl about their weekend getaway. On their way, the girl seems fascinated to see the fields and meadows during their train ride. This makes Cujo remember Greville's remark and wonders if Victorique may not have the normal freedom to go outside. When they arrive at the port, they see Greville already prepared for their cruise. The inspector informs them that Victorique's deductions about the murder are correct. In addition, the maid had shot the fortune teller's mystical mirror, thereby creating an excuse to commit the crime. Just as they're about to sail, one officer runs to Greville and informs him that the maid has escaped. Greville leaves Cujo and Victorique to their devices. The golden girl decides to rummage around the yacht. There, she discovers that it used to belong to Roxanne and there is an invitation for her to join the cruise on a ship called Miniature Garden Box. What's intriguing is the stated main menu, here's. Sensing more mysteries to unravel, Cujo and Victorique join the cruise. On the ship, Victorique enjoys her excellent dinner, while Cujo contents himself with bread. As for the other guests, they can't see them properly. Minutes later, everyone aboard the ship is passed out. When they come to, they find themselves in the ship's parlor. Victorique concludes that their food was drugged. One pretty lady makes a fuss about locked doors. She paces for a few steps near Cujo and Victorique, swinging her handbag lightly. Cujo unfortunately gets hit by the bag, and for such a small accessory, it almost causes a concussion on his head. Cujo gets up and walks over to a model of the ship they're on. It reminds him of the infamous ghost ship named Queen Berry. Just as he's about to touch it, someone yells at him and an arrow flies past him, narrowly missing his face. Everyone is frightened at this ominous turn of events. As if this isn't enough, they're suddenly enveloped in a blackout. When the light comes back, one wall is now smeared with a creepy message. And it says, It was ten years ago, but it seems like yesterday. This time it's your turn. The box has been prepared. Now hairs. Run. All the old men among them become positively frantic, almost delusional. They keep saying they're now inside the Queenberry, and they are the hares. One of them runs to the door and opens it, only to get hit by another arrow on his forehead. Someone exclaims the door is now free, and everyone scrambles to get out of there. Cujo is naturally confused, but he notices that Victorico remains calm in all this cheeks. When they get to the deck, they realize the storm is raging over the sea. It's practically impossible to travel back to the port using the lifeboat, but the desperate men see no other options. As expected, as soon as the lifeboat hits the sea, they're immediately engulfed by waves. In the end, only five of them remain. They all go back to the ship's parlor. However, the pretty lady screams in terror as she sees that the room is already in a state of decay, as if it has been submerged in the ocean for many years. They still enter the room to collect themselves and think about their next step. They introduce themselves to each other. The pretty lady is Julie Guile, daughter of a rich coal mine owner. The gentleman is Ned Baxter, a stage actor from London who likes playing with a tennis ball to relieve stress. The old dignitary is Maurice, and he works for Soville's foreign ministry. Victorique walks to Maurice and orders him to tell everything he knows about the ship they're in. He's the one who yelled at Cujo earlier, therefore, he must know something. Maurice reveals the true story behind the ghost ship Queenberry. 
It was a real ship that sank 10 years ago in the Mediterranean. A group of children, called hares, were brought aboard to spend the night on the ship. Each child represented a nationality. By daybreak, Maurice was the one tasked to check on them. He reported that the children turned against each other after the death of one of them. Only a handful survived. And now, the ghosts of those children have raised the Queen Berry to seek revenge. Victorique points out that ghosts can't do that, let alone send invitations. She concludes that someone must have commissioned a replica of the sunken ship. To prove her point, she asks Cujo to open the door across them. It is the same room that they were in earlier, and the only reason they're in the decayed room is because its doors are open, confusing Julie. Victorique also spots the ripped wallpaper, which initially covered the wall where the writings were done. Everything from the ship's layout to its interior is copied, and the culprit must have spent a lot of fortune just to exact revenge. The five of them don't have time to process this as Morris hears the water entering the ship. If this is indeed a replica of the Queen Berry, then there must be a radio room situated one level below. They all follow him as he runs along the hallway. Cujo offers to help Victorique since her strides are too small. The ship is full of traps, and at one point Victorique almost gets hit by another arrow. Thankfully, Cujo saves her. When they reach the lower level, they find it already flooded. Julie insists on crossing it, and everyone follows her. As they turn around the corner, Maurice pushes Julie away. He's already losing it. He opens a cupboard and pulls out a gun. He looks deranged as he asks who among them is the hare. He says that the original Queen Berry was loaded with weapons for the sole purpose of fueling the distrust among the children. In the first place, they were stirred by the so-called hunting dog. And now, he'll take that role to survive. Cujo stands in front of Victorique. At one point during the ordeal, he realizes he should live up to his father's name and be brave. In this case, Victorique deserves to be protected because he considers her his friend. He closes his eyes as he braces for the gunshot. But before he can fire his gun, Julie has gone ahead and taken care of him. She says she found her pistol earlier, behind a lamp. Ned orders her to throw her gun away. It's already bad enough without her carrying a weapon. Julie reluctantly throws it. She bumps into Cujo again, making her handbag fall. Victorique picks it up and notices that it's lighter than before. With Maurice gone, the four of them go back up to where they came from. But tragedy strikes again. Somehow, Ned gets ahead of them for a few seconds, and when Julie turns on the stairs landing, he sees him lying face down and close to the wall, with his left hand limp on his back. Cujo checks for his pulse, but it's already too late. As he's about to turn Ned's body, Victorique suddenly orders him to get away. He doesn't understand why until she pulls him closer and whispers that at this rate, they're going to get murdered as well. This time, she takes the lead and orders all of them to run. They enter an empty room where Victorique instructs them to find any weapon and then hide. She fears that someone will soon find them and end their lives. True enough, the door opens and reveals a crazed Ned holding a large axe. He finds Victorique, whom he easily lifts due to her petite frame. Cujo comes to her rescue, punching Ned with his newfound brass knuckles. In the commotion, Victorique's necklace snaps. She refuses to leave without it. Julie picks it up, just as Cujo lands a good blow on Ned, making him unconscious. Together, all three of them run up to the deck where the other radio room is located. Once there, Julie returns the necklace. As Cujo wears it around Victorique's neck, he asks her how she knew that Ned is still alive. Julie wants to know as well, since it was the same back then. Cujo finds Julie's comment suspicious, but she waves it off. Victorique explains that Ned played with a tennis ball, which can be used to temporarily stop the pulse when it's tucked firmly under his armpit. They find the radio room, but before they can get there, someone grabs Julie. Ned has managed to follow them, and he throws her aside. Cujo pushes Victorique inside and tells her to send an SOS. He'll hold Ned off until help arrives. With no choice, she enters the room, and he locks the door. He faces Ned, but the latter is taller and stronger than him. Soon, Ned beats Cujo, while saying that he was the hunting dog back then. 
As he raises his arm for the last blow, Julie strikes him on his back with the axe. Ned falls onto the sea to his death. With the dangers now over and Victorique managing to send signals for help, the three of them wait for their rescue. At daybreak, a barge arrives and rescues them from the sinking ship. When they get back to the port, Greville is already waiting to arrest Julie Guile. In his office, the whole truth is revealed. Julie is not the daughter of a rich coal mine owner, but an orphan who spent most of her life in a sanatorium. She also lied about the gun. She has had it the whole time concealed inside her handbag. Victoric figures this out when it had hit Cujo heavily at first, then became considerably lighter when she handed it to her. Then she reveals what really happened inside the Queen Berry ten years ago. She, along with several orphans from other countries, was kidnapped and brought to the ship. Ned was also there, and his supposed death was the catalyst to sow distrust among them. Soon, they find themselves murdering each other. Despite this, she managed to make friends with an Arabic girl. Together with the other survivors, they found the radio room. When they entered, men in suits were ogling at them, wanting to know which hair survived. Ned reported that France, Italy, America and Sauville did, and he represented England as the hunting dog. The fortune teller Roxanne came in with a mystical mirror in her hand, reciting a large-scale omen. A young man would die soon, sending the world into chaos and would become the beginning of everything. She orders the box to be sunk immediately and fulfill the revelation. Then, the hairs should be fattened up. Right after this experiment, the Great War broke out. The catalyst was the death of the Archduke of Austria, who was assassinated in Sarajevo. By the end of it, five countries emerged as winners. France, Italy, America, England and Sovol. Everyone in the office is speechless at this accurate yet chilling prediction. Julie adds that after this, she was given a large sum of money, but she couldn't manage the mental distress it caused her. She decided to save everything and recreate the Queenberry to exact revenge on behalf of the orphans who died then. When the interrogation is over, Greville escorts Julie to her prison cell. Along the hallway, they meet with another group of officers who are escorting the escaped maid from earlier. Julie recognises her as the girl she made friends with before. She realises she must have taken her revenge too, in her own way. Days pass after this incident. As usual, Greville takes all the credit for solving the mystery. But Victorique doesn't mind. She reveals that Greville is her half-brother, the legitimate son of the de Blois family. Meanwhile, she's considered the bastard, whose mother is considered dangerous by the government. When she was born, she was raised in solitary confinement within the family mansion. Cujo doesn't know what to think of this new information about his friend. Days after, Cujo and Victorique are embroiled again in another mystery that will give light to some of their famous ghost stories. Cujo becomes an unwilling suspect in a murder. Greville detains him before bringing him to Victorique for clarification. The Golden Girl listens, demanding Cujo to tell all the details he knows including his thoughts during that time. Cujo says he was asked by the schoolhouse mother, Sophie, to buy some supplies. Along the deserted road, lined with a long brick wall on one side and a forest on the other, he muses about the groceries. Then his thoughts turn to his aspirations of finding a girlfriend. He pauses for a few seconds to think about the best characteristic before settling on blonde hair. When he reaches the crossing, he sees a lone rider riding fast on his motorcycle. To his surprise, the rider crashes onto the wall before flying out of his vehicle. Cujo's surprise turns to horror when the rider's head separates from the body. He reports the incident to Greville, but the latter arrests him instead. It's not logical that the head suddenly separates from the body just by crashing into a wall, Greville says. The only logical thing is if someone near has managed to cut off the head, and Cujo happens to be there. Greville brings out the murder weapon that Cujo has supposedly used, a wire that has been coiled. There are blood traces on the middle part and, curiously, on one of its ends. Victorique says it's possible to commit the murder even without getting close to the victim. If the wire is strung in the middle of the bright road, it's almost impossible to notice it, let alone a rider who's speeding on his motorcycle. Greville unwillingly lets Cujo go. As he rides the lift down, his sister tells him the culprit is a small woman with blonde hair. Most probably she's in a hospital. 
tending to an injured finger. Cujo asks Victoric how she came up with that conclusion. She says the culprit must have been significantly smaller than the victim, and afraid. This can explain the method of the murder. As for the blonde hair, she says Cujo must have unknowingly seen the culprit, and the hair became part of his daydreaming. She adds that after the murder, the culprit tried to remove the wire, thus injuring her finger and ran away when she saw Cujo coming. Again, Cujo is amazed at Victorique's deduction skills. However, their conversation somehow turns into a mild disagreement, mostly thanks to the girl's rude comments. For all her intelligence, Victorique's interpersonal skills leave a lot to be desired. She's too proud for her own good. As for Cujo, he leaves her there, vowing to himself never to return. But later, he's going to change his mind. His reputation as the school's Black Reaper intensifies when they learn of his involvement in the Queen Berry case. Indeed, wherever he goes, there's a corpse to be found. He also overhears the whispers about him visiting the Golden Fairy of the library. This makes him wonder if they even know about Victorique, or if they just simply love to gossip. Thankfully, a distraction arrives in the form of a new classmate. Cecil introduces Avril Bradley, an exchange student from England. She has blonde hair in a boyish cut, a mole just below her lips, and a bandaged right hand. Cujo feels unsettled as Avril reminds him of the culprit from the earlier case. He reminds himself the girl has been arrested and Avril is a different girl. During the break, Avril asks him to tour her around the school. Cujo thinks she's pretty, elegant, and fine-mannered. That's why it's a surprise to know she also loves ghost stories. Her favourite is the story of the cursed 13th step, also known as 13th step to heaven. Then, she tells him about her grandfather, Lord Bradley, who is known as the Great Adventurer. She says she wants to be like him someday. They continue their walk until they spot the library tower. Cujo wonders what Victorica is doing now. Then he remembers her remark about her growing in isolation. He realises that he should have been more lenient towards her. Cujo and Avril turn around when they hear Cecil calling them. The teacher asks them to help with something. They all went to the school's crypt that has been locked for eight years. Two men are already trying to open it. Cujo helps them and when they finally open it, a mummified knight topples over them. Cecil faints, prompting the two men to call for help. While he checks on the teacher's condition, Cujo notices Avril entering the crypt. She picks up a book from the ground and looks at it for a long time. He can't explain it, but something about Avril Bradley raises red flags in Cujo's mind. The school learns of this and, of course, students are convinced that Cujo is indeed the Black Reaper, but he doesn't care. He's back in the garden, on top of the library tower, and gives Victorique some toys and snacks for compensation, along with his story about the new student named Avril and her suspicious behaviour with the book. Greville arrives and gives them an update about the Mummy Knight. It's been identified as the corpse of someone named Maxime, a former student of the school. He was an eccentric man who used to return to the school during springtime. Rumours of thievery, blackmail and swindling followed him, but nothing concrete had been proven. He vanished around eight years ago, so to find his corpse locked in the crypt is a mystery waiting to be solved. The last time the crypt was opened was when a student named Millie Marl was interred after succumbing to her death. Even then, Maxime wasn't found inside the crypt. While chewing her snacks, Victory Quay tells them she needs two more pieces of information to come up with a sound deduction. First, the flowers that adorned that knight's chest. And second, if there's a missing corpse from the crypt. Cujo and Greville go down to check on the second one. After a few minutes, the caretaker confirms one body from the back is missing. As they go back to the tower, Greville is disgruntled about this affair with mummies and corpses. But Cujo is not listening as he's just seen Avril walking out of the tower. When they reach Victorique, they confirm her suspicions and add that the flowers were originally primrose. Finally, she has the missing puzzle pieces and is ready to tell the truth about what happened to Maxime. The culprit was Millie Marl. She gave Maxime a strong soporific, making him sleep. Then, she dressed him as a knight and dragged him towards the far end of the crypt. She laid him there and put the primrose on his chest. Maxim only woke up after Millie's passing and internment inside the crypt. 
he got trapped inside until his own demise. Greville goes back again to the lift when Victorique instructs him to investigate the relationship between Millie and Maxime. Because in the language of flowers, primrose means being together forever. It signified how deep and strong a woman's feelings are. For the first time, Greville becomes serious and addresses his sister. Don't tell me that, he says, and calls her Grey Wolf. Cujo is curious, but Victoric is indifferent. He nags her to help him settle his mind about Avril and the book. She insults him first before relenting. Without warning, she runs down the stairs towards the floor that contains books about religions. From what Cujo has told her, Avril likes ghost stories, especially the story of 13th Step to Heaven. And if she wants to hide a book from Cujo, the library is the best hiding spot. Upon reaching the section about heaven, Victorique climbs a library ladder, stops at the 13th step, and pulls out a book. Cujo is amazed that it's the same one Avril picked up earlier. The book's title is The Golden Fairy of the High Tower. It chronicles the tales about a mythical golden fairy locked in a high tower who gives people answers to their questions in exchange for a piece of their soul. The illustration bears a strong resemblance to Victorique. As they read together, they stumble upon an inserted postcard. It's addressed to Avril Bradley from her grandfather, Lord Bradley. There's no postmark on the stamp, which means it hasn't been delivered. Victorique smirks as she realizes another mystery is about to come her way. But Cujo misses all the hints. She tells him to take the book and call it a day. Cujo walks back to the dormitories when he sees Gravel sitting on a bench looking serious. As it happens, there's another case he needs to solve. A phantom thief known as Quiran has plundered a nearby village the other night. He is a well-known robber around Europe, but he suddenly vanished around eight years ago. Recently, a second-generation Quiran has appeared and continued the legacy of thieving. And the next target is the school. Abruptly, Greville stands and tells Cujo to report anyone suspicious before leaving. Befuddled by all these, Cujo continues to walk until he passes by the old storehouse. Without any reason at all, he attempts to open its rusted gate, but someone hits him from the back. When he wakes up later, Avril is beside him in the infirmary. She says she found him unconscious on the ground, so she brought him there. However, the book is missing again. Cujo can't help but suspect Avril to have hit him earlier, but then she says that there's a ghost wandering inside the storehouse so it could be the one who hit him. She also mentions whether the golden fairy of the library is real. He confirms that she is, and her name is Victorique. Avril smiles knowingly as she takes this information. Cujo returns to the storehouse to look for the book. A few minutes later, Cecil arrives, holding what he's looking for. She says she found it lying nearby, which leads him to think that perhaps it's not Avril who hit him. The teacher also expresses her gratitude for his help with the Mummy Night affair the other day, but their conversation is interrupted when they hear soft moans from the inside of the storehouse. They move closer and they can hear the ghost asking for help. Together they scream and run. In the library tower, Avril searches for the supposed golden fairy, but she scoffs at the idea that the character exists. Perhaps it's just an old man, or there's no fairy at all. Her search is interrupted by Cujo calling for Victorique. She has no choice but to greet Cujo and leave. He calls for the golden girl until she appears. After giving Victorique another snack, he tells her about his accident and the phantom thief that Greville mentioned earlier. Victorique, after enjoying the snacks, finally tells Cujo what she has reconstructed using the clues of the mystery. She says that the first Quiran was Maxim, who disappeared eight years ago due to being locked in the crypt. Presumably, he was looking for a place to hide the book when he returned to the school. Now, the second generation Quiaran is looking for it and attempting to revive the legacy of thievery. And that thief is Avril Bradley. Disappointed that another case has been solved, Victorique sighs and turns back to her books. But Cujo insists on addressing the so-called ghost at the storehouse, who had been moaning for help. Instantly, she orders him to go right away and save the ghost because that ghost is none other than the real Avril Bradley. Together with Greville, Cujo checks the inside of the storehouse until he steps on a loose board. Opening it reveals a tied girl 
looking similar to the one posing as Avril. She seems unhurt, but when she opens her eyes, she has a breakdown. She says that the girl is impersonating her. She met her at the train on her way to St. Marguerite. When they arrived there, she hit her, and a struggle ensued, injuring the impostor on her hand. Avril says the impostor is after her grandfather's legacy hidden in the school. Cujo leaves her to Greville's care. He goes straight to the library tower, where the imposter is already there. Kuyaran doesn't deny it when he calls her by that name. She reveals she's not after the book, but the postcard inserted in it. It has a rare stamp called Penny Black, the very first postage stamp in the world, and it's worth millions in today's money. She demands Kujo to give it to her, but he doesn't know where it is. She taunts him for believing a golden fairy exists in this library that he's just a lonely exchange boy making up imaginary characters. She demands again to know where Penny Black is, and when he says he doesn't know, she pushes him down the stairs. She's about to attack him when Victorique finally appears and drops a stack of books on top of Kuyaran. The thief falls the rest of the long flight of stairs. Later that night, Cujo checks on Avril. She looks like she is recovered from her ordeal. He gives her the postcard. Avril becomes emotional, as it's her last memento from her grandfather. The next day, he goes back to the library tower. Victorique seems to be in a good mood as she explains the rest of the mysteries. Second generation Kuyaran utilized ghost stories to her advantage, covering all her tracks in thievery. In addition, the first Kuyaran was originally the Black Reaper and the progenitor of the story, the Reaper that comes in the spring, that has been hounding Cujo since he arrived at the school. He might have been romantically involved with Millie Marl, so when she passed away, the fictional story came to light. As usual, Cujo is amazed. He asks where she was hiding when Cuyaron was looking for her. She points at a table with a sizable cabinet that can accommodate Victorique's petite form and her stash of sweets and books. Now that the mummy night affair is over, Cujo and Victorique sit in silence. He ponders that she may be the golden fairy from fiction, but she's only craving companionship after having been isolated for the first years of her life. A few days later, Cujo and Avril are in the town market to window shop. It's remarkable how the girl recovered easily from her abduction and confinement. She likes ghost stories and has discovered many school secrets. She's found out about the grey wolf living in the library, which is new to Cujo. Then they see a group of people surrounding a red-haired magician doing tricks. However, the magician fails to pull out a live pigeon from his hat, but when he sees Cujo, he grabs his books, puts them in his hat, and pulls out a turban that's most likely a part of a dancer's costume. Cujo mourns for the loss of his books, but then they're called by a nun to look at her merchandise. She prides her most important product, an authentic Dresden plate. Cujo notices she reeks of alcohol and is sitting indecently for her vocation. Avril picks up a music box. When she opens it, it creates a small dust explosion and pigeons suddenly fly out from nowhere. Then they hear the nun scream, her prized plate has gone missing. Cujo goes back to the library tower to tell Victorique about what happened. But she's more interested in the turban that he brought. She wears it, just as Greville arrives to consult them about the Dresden plate theft. When he sees Victorique, he positively shivers and calls her Cordelia Gallo. Victorique removes the turban and correctly assumes Greville's purpose in being there. She explains that the nun is the culprit, at least based on Cujo's tale. No modest nun would sit the way that nun did. Most likely, she's sitting on top of a cage full of pigeons. When the music box exploded, she released the birds as a distraction. She took the plate and hid it inside a secret compartment of the cage. The next day, Cujo sees that Greville has solved the theft, but the plate is nowhere to be found. Next to the article is a small advertisement, calling out to the descendants of the Grey Wolves to come back to the village for the summer solstice. When he mentions this to Victorique, the girl immediately gets interested. A little mishap happens when she trips over Cujo's legs. She pouts as she nurses her forehead, which makes him think she's susceptible to pain. So what does he do next? Flick her on the forehead. Good job, Cujo. Now, Victorique is pissed at him and won't talk to him anymore. Later that night, he sees her dragging a huge suitcase. Although he questions why she needs all the things inside, Cujo still decides to come with her to wherever her destination is. 
Then he finds himself boarding a train to Horovit, the place mentioned in the advertisement about grey wolves. Viktorika chose to go there, but he doesn't have any idea why. On their way, they meet the nun from earlier. She says she came from Horovit and is coming home. It's already deep in the night when they arrive at the inn near the village. The owner says other tourists have also responded to the advertisement. He's familiar with the legends about the intelligent creatures lurking deep within the mountain forest. Some wolves are living there, naturally, but he assures them that the village of the Grey Wolves is inhabited by humans. He describes them as having long blonde hair, green eyes, and small stature. Then he sees Viktorik, and he's positively terrified. It seems like the village has an occult-like reputation that's enigmatic to the population of Sauville. Cujo and Victorique settle in their respective rooms. But Cujo is awoken by a lone howl of a wolf. He checks on his companion, who is now sleep-talking and sleepwalking. When Victorique fully awakes, she's abashed that he's seen her in that state. But he calms her down and directly asks her why she's here. She thinks about it before revealing her intentions. She's there to prove her mother's innocence. Victorique is the illegitimate child of Marquis de Blois and an exotic dancer named Cordelia Gallo, who hailed from the village of the Grey Wolves. People of the village were known to be highly intellectual, so the Marquis chose to impregnate her and have his bloodline mixed with such near-mythical people. But he discovered her secret. She was accused of a crime and was exiled from the village. Because of this, Cordelia escaped from the Marquis, leaving her daughter in isolation. Victorique is convinced her mother is innocent, and it's up to her to prove it. The next day, the carriage is ready to bring them to the gates of the village. The road is dense with fog, making the surroundings conducive for wolf hunts. There are six of them visiting, Cujo and Victorique, the nun, and three men who are friends. After a bumpy journey, they finally arrive at their destination. The place looks more like a fortress than a village, Welcoming them is a wall of men, wielding swords, looking fiercely at Victorique. But the village elder stops them. He says she's a descendant who answered the summons. There's no reason to drive her out, even if her mother was a criminal. From where we left off last time, we see Cujo and Victorique, along with other guests, arriving at the gates of the infamous village of the Wolves, situated in the mountains of Horovitz town in the kingdom of Soville. Victorique has a mission to complete there, to clear the name of her mother, Cordelia Gallo, from the crime pinned on her years ago. The village elder, Sergius, along with his assistant Ambrose, welcome their guests to the Summer Solstice Festival. Aside from the two St. Marguerite students, the other guests are Mildred, the nun, and three friends named Alan, Derek, and Raoul. It's extremely noticeable how the fog almost covers the streets and roofs of the buildings in the village like a gaseous blanket. Sergius becomes alert when he hears the howls of the wolves and fires a warning shot using Ambrose's rifle. Then he continues orienting the visitors despite their bewildered reactions. He says their village has been closed off to civilization for many centuries, but they have managed to become self-sustained. The festival, which will be held for the whole day tomorrow, is their celebration and thanksgiving to their ancestors for the bountiful harvest all year round. They arrive at his mansion, where they're welcomed by Harminia, a neurotic maid. Upon seeing Victorique, she grabs her face in a frenzied manner and talks about Cordelia. During lunch, Sergius explains to anyone interested in the story of Cordelia's crime. The incident happened 20 years ago in the study of the previous elder, Theodore. Cordelia, who was 15 at that time, was in the habit of changing the water in the jug. Sergius says he saw her enter at precisely midnight because he checked his pocket watch. Then her screams woke the whole household. They rushed to the study, where they found Theodore's lifeless body on the floor, with the knife stabbed into his back up to its hilt. There were gold coins scattered around him. For some reason, those who witnessed Cordelia entering the study claimed different times, and nothing was concluded. Regardless, Sergius, who replaced Theodore as the next elder, had judged that Cordelia was to be blamed for the elder's death and should be exiled. He was adamant that no sinner should remain in the village. And yet, in the present, he's face to face with Cordelia's daughter, who looks exactly like her. After this rather unappetizing meal, Cujo and Victorique roam around the village when they meet Ambrose. 
He's a curious lad who's fascinated by Cujo's heritage. When Victorique asks him about Cordelia's previous residence, he becomes terrified. It seems like the name of the criminal and the crime itself is a taboo topic among the residents. Still, he leads them to a small hut that's been neglected for many years. Upon inspection, Victorique finds a loose board. She and Cujo open it together, only to find a lone photograph of Cordelia holding an infant Victorique. The presence of the photograph there means Cordelia had managed to return to the village since the picture could have only been taken after her exile and after Victoric was born. The two then proceed to the cemetery where they find Theodore's tomb. After digging, they see something etched on the rock. It says, I am innocent, see. Victorique becomes teary-eyed as she strongly believes her mother's statement about her innocence. But before they can discuss it, they hear the howl of the wolves that have surrounded them. Oddly, the animals have the same bright green eyes as the village people. The two run back to the elders' mansion. There, they learn from Mildred and the men that the reason the village became self-sustained was because of a benefactor named Brian Roscoe. They say he was a descendant from someone who left the village and came here ten years ago to Providi capital. That night, Victoric amuses about this Brian Roscoe character. It's strange that he came here ten years ago to Providi for the village around the same time the Great War happened and when that photograph was taken. But perhaps that's a mystery meant to be solved at another time. The next day, the activities for the festival start early. Cujo is fascinated to see three large floats being prepared for the main event. Ambrose approaches them and explains the main act of the celebration. It's the dramatization of how the summer army defeated the winter man and the subsequent burning of his army. An effigy of the Winter Man is already being prepared to be boarded on one of the floats. Everyone is enjoying the festivities, except for the three men who are being scolded by Harmenia. Apparently, they've been disrespecting the villagers' practices and culture, inciting animosity from the villagers. Soon, three beautiful maidens shower hazelnuts onto the onlookers, signaling the start of the main event. Victorique notices Alan, one of the guests, covering his face from getting hit by the nuts. She returns her attention to the skit, where Ambrose is participating as well. By the end of it, the three large floats are set on fire, symbolizing the end of the winter man and the start of a bountiful harvest in the summer. To everyone's horror, the effigy starts flailing its arms and produces a blood-curdling scream. The men put out the fire and destroy the floats to save whoever is trapped inside the effigy, but they're too late. To their surprise, the unfortunate man who burned to death is Alan. They put his corpse aside. Just as they are deciding what to do with it, Sergius insists on continuing the festivities. The death of a clumsy tourist isn't worth it to be bothered with. Later, Cujo still thinks the elder is indeed indifferent to non-villagers. When he turns to ask Victorique's opinion, she's already missing. Cujo runs around to look for her. It's almost sundown when he arrives at the church, where there's a long line of children outside a confessional Apparently, part of the festivities is the Midsummer Oracle given by the Elder, and children are encouraged to ask one question. Ambrose spots Cujo and pushes him inside. Elder Sergius asks Cujo what his question is. Although a bit shy, Cujo asks if he and his friend Victorique will stay together for a long time. The Elder closes his eyes for a few seconds before opening them wide. He looks deranged as he recites the cryptic answer that Cujo and Victorique won't die together. A strong gale will hit and shake the world years from now. This gale will separate them, but their hearts will never be apart. After this ominous announcement, the elder returns to normal and beckons the next child to enter. Cujo is bewildered. He's still thinking about it when he spots Victorique. She says she went to the elder's study where the crime was committed. There, she finally reconstructed the fragments of chaos from this mystery. She knows who the culprit is, but the problem is how to make the culprit admit the crime. Before she can think of anything, the howling of the wolves permeates the air. Elder Sergius runs out of the church holding a gun. Together with Ambrose, they run to the forest to scare away the animals. Victorique and Cujo follow. They look for the traces of the wolves. A rustle in the bushes prompts Sergius to shoot in that direction, not listening to Victorique's warning. When they get there, they see Raoul lying on the ground, with a gunshot wound on his chest. Derek is beside his friend, crying. 
Victorique sees a single hazelnut falling off Derek's jacket, and in that moment, she knows what exactly happened. Sergius refuses to take responsibility, insisting he shot a wolf, but with many witnesses and without credible evidence, it'll be hard to prove his innocence. Two murders have already happened, and they're a great blow to the elder's pride. Cujo, Victorique, and Ambrose stand on a ledge as they watch the sunset, discussing the incidents. Ambrose mentions Brian Roscoe, the village's benefactor. He remembers the man visiting the village when he was still young and teaching him about life in the outside world. Since then, Ambrose has always nursed the dream of crossing the bridge and exploring the outside world. But he couldn't leave the village, as he sensed there was still something that needed to be addressed here. Victorique understands his sentiments. But for now, they need to catch the real culprit behind the murders. Night has already fallen. The trio hides behind the church altar to wait for the culprit. A few moments later, that man enters the premises. Derek grabs the vase made of pure gold. But before he can flee, the church doors open again, revealing Inspector Greville de Blois. He runs towards Derek and apprehends him. Sergius and several men join them as Victorique explains the truth. Alan, Raoul and Derek were thieves who chose to rob the village of the wolves. Their drunkenness and disrespect were only a ruse to scout for anything valuable. However, the three had a falling out, leading Derek to eliminate his associates. He used the festivities and Sergius' behaviour around wolves as cover for his plans. The proof of his crimes was the hazelnut that was placed on him while pretending to be Alan and while pretending to be crying beside Raoul's body. Victorique addresses Sergius, telling him he's innocent of committing the crimes. The elder scoffs at the idea that the daughter of a criminal exonerates him from wrongdoing. Anyhow, he orders his men to take Derek away for his punishment later. Greville protests but saying the capture of the criminal is under the jurisdiction of the Kingdom of Sauville. Sergius refutes this. He claims Sauville has no authority here because this place is the ancient Kingdom of Sirun. And he, Sergius, is the king whose words are the laws of this land. Everyone is bewildered by this pronouncement. Later, Cujo, Victorique, Greville and Ambrose gather at the Elder's dining hall. Greville still has to answer why he is there when Mildred appears. As it turns out, Mildred is not actually a nun, but a gambler and a petty thief. She was caught by Greville double-crossing another player in a game of poker. Instead of arresting her, he offered her a job. That was to tail his sister who was on her way to Horowitz. Remember, Victorique was not allowed to leave the premises of the school without Greville's permission. Mildred was the one who called the inspector to update him on everything that had happened in the village. Victorique doesn't mind it all. Rather, she wants to focus on her main mission here in the village, and she needs Cujo's help to enact her plans. Everyone gathers at the village square to witness the closing ceremony of the festival. One of them is Harminia, whose face shows a manic anticipation for something. Several men come out of the church, led by a man in an evil mask. He stops in front of Harmenia, walks to her, and whispers something ominous. The neurotic maid breaks down, thinking the man is the reincarnated soul of Elder Theodore. In panic, she admits her crime of killing Theodore 20 years ago. Everyone becomes silent as this piece of truth rings through the night. Cujo removes the mask, and calls Victorique and others to apprehend the maid. Then, Victorique starts piecing together the fragments of chaos of this mystery. She says the crime had the same structure as the Dresden plate robbery, where pigeons were used as distractions. But in this case, it's gold coins. On that night, Harminia hid inside the grandfather clock and waited for Theodore. When he came, she threw coins to distract the elder. She was just a kid back then, too small and weak to cause any serious harm to an adult. That's why, when she jumped to stab the elder, she used her body weight to put more force. This drove the knife into his body up to its hilt. Then she locked the door, hid again inside the grandfather clock, and waited for the first person who'd take the blame. That unfortunate person was Cordelia. In the present, they apprehend Harminia and bring her to Sergius' study room. There, Victorique explains another facet of the mystery. Only Sergius was correct about the time of death. The reason why witnesses told different times was because the grandfather clock didn't chime due to Harminia hiding inside. 
and her motive for doing the crime, the oracle that Theodore made about her, that she'd only live until her 26th year. She couldn't accept that prediction back then and thought that stabbing Theodore would nullify the oracle. Again, she was young back then, but only if she knew that fate would always have its way to fulfill what's always meant to be. Sergius orders Ambrose to cut Harminia's head. It's her 26th year, and it's time to see that oracle come true. Ambrose doesn't want to do it. He frees Harminia, who runs out of the mansion. Soon, they all discover that she has set fire to the village. Greville and others run after her, who is now standing on the drawbridge, the only way that connects the village to the outside world. She sets it on fire, while madly saying she's going to live past 26. Greville and Mildred manage to cross the bridge, but Harminia blocks Cujo and Victorique. She slashes the spear wildly, while counting the years she'll live. Then, she corners Cujo. Just as she's about to stab him, Ambrose runs to her and takes the spear away. She takes one wrong step backward, and then she falls to her death. Cujo, Victorique, and Ambrose run to the other side of the bridge. Cujo almost doesn't make it, but Victorique saves him. Unbeknownst to them, on a cliff far from them, stand two people, looking at the great village fire. The man says to the petite lady that her sins have gone down in flames. Later, Cujo, Victorique, Greville, Ambrose and Mildred are on their way to the train station. Ambrose says the elder knows about his dream of seeing the outside world and has encouraged him to cross the bridge. Greville remarks about what Sergius said earlier, that the place is actually called Seirun. Victorique explains that there have been historical accounts about an ancient forest tribe named Seirun that conquered a part of Europe. They lacked physical strength but boasted their exceptional intelligence. However, they disappeared from history. It's safe to say the people in the village are the descendants of the said tribe. Victorique ends her tale by saying it all happened in the past. What's important is that they're living in the present. Days after their adventure in the village of the wolves, Cujo and Victorique will find themselves embroiled in another intriguing mystery. As in the usual fashion, it all starts with a ghost tale about young girls getting lured by live mannequins inside a haunted department store. Avril is a fan of these scary stories, and she always shares them with Cujo. After she's done with her tale, he brings out a shopping list sent by his sister from Japan. Among the list is the famous souvenir, the Blue Rose. Avril explains that the Blue Rose is the national treasure of the Seville royal family, but it was stolen during the war. In the present, replicas of the jewel are sold as paperweights at the old department store named Jean Tan. Cujo thanks her for the information, then he proceeds to the library tower. He finds Victorique there, who's already bored without any mysteries to solve. Cujo gives her the kimono his sister sent as a gift. He offers to teach Victorique how to put it on, but the prideful girl refuses to listen. In the end, Cujo leaves her, saying he'll go to Sobrem to do some shopping. Victorique bids him goodbye, hoping he'll stumble upon a good case. That afternoon, she leaves the library tower and goes home to her true residence, a house situated in the middle of a huge garden maze. When she reaches her room, she immediately removes her clothes and dons the kimono and its obi, but she doesn't know how to wear them. She ends up draping the kimono and haphazardly tying the obi around her. Then she goes to sleep. It is a cold night and the garment is thin. The next day, she wakes up with a flu. Cecil, Cujo's homeroom teacher, informs him about Victorique's situation. Since he can't enter her house to visit, he simply gives Cecil two things for Victorique. One is a step-by-step -step illustrated guide on how to wear the kimono and a book about famous ghost stories. Then he takes the train ride to Sobraim, the capital of Soville. During the journey, Greville unexpectedly walks into his compartment. The inspector tells Cujo he's been summoned to Sobraim to investigate several stolen artworks suddenly appearing in the black market, as well as reports about a string of disappearances involving young girls and women. While he talks incessantly, Cujo thinks back to that time when Victorique saved him from falling off the cliff. He wonders if that incident has something to do with the oracle he received from Sergius. When they arrive at the city, Greville drops Cujo off in front of the Giantan department store. It's an old establishment that gives off the aura of aristocracy. Inside, 
Cujo is a bit overwhelmed by the wealth displayed inside. A salesman approaches him and asks him what he's looking for. Cujo mentions the blue rose paperweight, and the salesman directs him to where he should go. However, Cujo gets off the elevator on the wrong floor. Luckily, when he enters a room, he spots it. He picks it up and admires its sparkle. A gruff, unkind voice calls him, making him drop the gem on the floor. A middle-aged man and a beautiful lady are looking at him, demanding to know why he's there. Cujo explains that he's only looking for the paperweight. In the same voice, the man tells him where he can find what he's looking for. Cujo rides the elevator, thinking about the people he just met. Something about them bothers him, especially with the lady whose beauty seems cold. Because his mind's still full of them, he fails to get on the right floor. Instead, he finds himself in the basement. He's about to leave when he hears a whimper. Although afraid, he investigates the source of the noise. He finds a pile of discarded mannequins. When he opens a box, he finds one with its eyes closed. Wait, are the mannequin's eyes supposed to be closed? The mannequin suddenly grabs him and cries about demons. He tries to calm her, but the girl can't be placated. Then the light turns off, and when it returns, the girl is gone. Freaked out, Cujo proceeds to the police station. He requests Greville to make an investigation about it. At first, the inspector doesn't want to, but his superior, Superintendent General Signore, arrives, and suddenly Greville wants to come with Cujo. The two go back to Jantar. Cujo confidently identifies the salesman who assisted him earlier, but to his bewilderment, the salesman can't remember him. In fact, no one seems to recognize him. The man with the gruff voice from earlier approaches them, together with the beautiful lady. He's Garnier, the owner of the Jantan, and she's his secretary. They're gracious enough to accompany Greville and Cujo to the room the latter has been to. To his surprise, it's now a completely different room. And when they get to the basement, the box now contains a real mannequin, with the girl nowhere to be found. Greville scolds Cujo for wasting his time. After he leaves the boy, a peasant woman grabs Cujo by the shoulders and demands him to return her daughter. Because of this, he falls to the ground and his coins fall from his pocket. A small boy approaches them, correctly guesses the amount of coins that have fallen from Cujo's pocket and stops the woman from harassing him. His name is Luigi, who looks cocky despite his dirty clothes. He offers Cujo vital information. At 11.50 Siam, some men entered the mall's back door, bringing in new wallpapers and paints. This implies that somebody inside ordered a quick renovation while Cujo was in the police station. He decides to call Victorique to ask for help. But it seems the girl won't be much help at the moment. Victorique is fighting off Cecil and the school doctor from giving her a flu shot. In the end, the pair won. Victorique picks up the receiver to hear from Cujo, but he's not there anymore. He's been kidnapped by the girl from earlier. Her name is Anastasia and she comes from a wealthy family in Russia. She was visiting Sobrem when she was lured by a sales lady from Giantin into trying on clothes and subsequently got captured. She says she could see the royal palace from where she was imprisoned along with other girls. She managed to escape and that's how she ended up inside the box. When she remembers her ordeal, Anastasia becomes so scared she speaks incoherently. She talks about demons cursing them as they chant and raise their hands. If a girl is cursed, she's taken away and never comes back. Cujo puts his arms around Anastasia in an attempt to calm her. He wants to help, but he doesn't know how to prove that something fishy is going on inside Adontan. If only there's someone who can watch the building and identify anomalies. He suddenly remembers Luigi. With a new possibility to consider, he instructs Anastasia to proceed to the police station, find Inspector de Blois and tell him her story. He assures her he'll follow after he takes care of something. With that, Anastasia agrees. Cujo gets off the carriage to look for the boy. Fortunately, he finds him. He knows Luigi has an impressive memory based on their encounter earlier. Therefore, he hopes he can identify who had entered the building but never came out. But Luigi is reluctant. He has tried reporting his observations before, but the police never believed him. Cujo persuades him that this time will be different because he'll make sure someone will listen. Luigi looks at him and decides to trust him. On their way to the station, 
they pass by the theater that boasts a catchy poster. It's about a show called Phantasmagoria, starring an illusionist named Brian Roscoe. Cujo can't remember why the name sounds familiar. A few feet away, a group of people ogle at a carriage and from where a huge chest doll is being carried by workers. The owner, a red-haired man, reminds the workers to be careful with it because the lady has the flu, as he says. Now, Cujo has seen this man before in the market where the Dresden plate was stolen. But he has no time to ponder on this, as Luigi urges him to rush. When they get to the station, the boy immediately assists the police by identifying the young girls he'd seen entering John Tan, but never came out. At the same time, SG Signore is finished interrogating Anastasia and confirms they have enough reason to conduct a raid at the said department store. He expects Greville to lead the operation. With no choice, he asks Cuyo to call Victorique. In a private room, they connect with her. Surprisingly, she already has an idea about what's going on, but she still needs Cujo's details to make a deduction. After a few minutes, Victorique decides she has all the information needed. First, the blue rose that Cujo first found earlier is the actual artifact stolen from the royal family during the war. Presumably, it's part of the things being traded in the black market. Next, to find the room that Anastasia mentioned, they need to use some phony physics to trick Garnier and his staff. That night, Greville leads the raid on the Jantin department store. They find the hidden cellar behind the mirror in one of the fitting rooms. But it's not enough to prove something illegal is going on. Greville and Cujo appear to argue, but in truth, it's simply a ruse to distract Garnier and his staff from what the police are doing, which is pressing their hands filled with blue Johnstone powder on windows. When Greville orders the light to be turned off, the handprints glow in the dark. The only window that doesn't have one must be the room where Anastasia was imprisoned. Indeed, SG Signore reports the seventh window on the fifth floor has no handprint. Greville orders his officers to proceed there, but the secretary stops them. Apparently, she's learned martial arts. In the end, Cujo is the one who gets there and finds the secret door to that room. When he enters, he finds himself in the middle of an auction where the audience selects and bids for the young girls on stage. It's sickening to realize Anastasia has gone through this. A few minutes later, SG Signore leads his men to arrest everyone in the room. Pandemonium ensues as everyone scrambles away from the police. Later, they capture the criminals and take care of the girls. Cujo leads Greville to the blue rose he saw earlier. With a drop test, they finally confirm it's the real gem. Days after the raid, the truth about Garnier comes out. He's part of the gang that broke into the royal treasury and stole precious artworks and gems, including the Blue Rose. The money they earned from selling stolen products was used to buy Jantin to become their base of operations for smuggling. Anastasia has finally recovered and is set to live with her relatives in Sauville. As for Luigi, due to his impressive memory, he's given a scholarship, paid for by Jacqueline de Signor. She's the wife of Greville's boss. Back in St. Marguerite, Victorique seems to be recovering well from her flu. As thanks for her help in solving the case, Cujo gives her a gift, a jade shoe for Victorique's ceramic pipe. All seems to be well in the succeeding days after the Jantan raid. However, behind the scenes of peaceful Soville living, some powerful entities are making sure their investments are kept safe and hidden from the world. Greville receives a call from his father, Marquis Albert de Blois. He's learned about Victorique's escapade to the village of the wolves. He reminds his son that he's the salt of the earth, useful only when it suits him. He tells Greville to always keep an eye on his sister. After the call, Greville is reminded again that everything he's done is only to gain his father's favor. If there's something he has that he can truly own, it's his sentiments towards a certain woman. This woman is now drinking lemonade with her maid. Jacqueline de Signore is a cheerful and playful lady. Her maid, Marion, is always catching her breath whenever her mistress does something spontaneous. Today, they're going to Saint Marguerite to donate some books. When Marion follows her mistress towards their carriage, she bumps into a man who is also holding a chest box similar to hers. After apologies and murmurs of annoyance are made, Marion picks up the box and rides the carriage. After arriving at the school, Jacqueline requests that a certain student accompany them for the tour. She knows Cujo is studying here. So Cecil calls him, 
and Cujo consents to be their guide. He remembers his conversation with Victorique about Jacqueline. It turns out the woman is Greville's first love, although she doesn't know about it. They've known each other since their childhood, and Jacqueline is partly the reason why the inspector has adopted his eccentric pompadour. As their tour progresses, Cujo observes how odd Jacqueline is compared to other proper ladies. He can also see that she genuinely cares for Greville as a friend. Despite not knowing why he suddenly changed his hairstyle, Cujo vows not to mention anything to her as it's not his place to do so. They arrive at the library tower, where Jacqueline shares a tale about the building's origins. According to legends, the king back in the 17th century had the botanical garden built for one purpose, a place of rendezvous with his lover. Marion reminds her that they need to leave soon because they will still visit Greville in his office. But Jacqueline becomes excited at the prospect of seeing the garden, so she starts climbing the stairs. Marion and Cujo have no choice but to follow her. When she reaches the top, Jacqueline sees Victorique disguising herself as a life-size doll. It seems like she doesn't know the girl or her familial relationship with Greville. But Jacqueline is good-natured enough, and Victorique tries to be nice to her. When asked about why they're at the school, Marion answers that her mistress intends to donate some books. She opens the chest box, but instead of seeing books, it contains a variety of cosmetics. Marion realizes she must have picked up the wrong box when she bumped into the man earlier. That man is now in Greville's office, pleading to have his box returned as it's his livelihood. Greville sees the Signora Crest on the box, confirming that it's Jacqueline's. Afraid that she might meet his sister there, he immediately sets out to return the books himself. Back at the library tower, Jacqueline doesn't fuss about her misplaced books. Instead, she appreciates the beauty of the garden, especially the paintings on the ceilings. Then she looks at Victorique, who's munching on sweets and is instantly reminded of her previous pet, a chipmunk named Q. She also remembers the case related to the animal, where she became the main suspect. Back then, she was single but was expected to accept Signori's marriage proposal. Her pet Q was brought to a veterinarian to be treated, but unfortunately, the animal passed away. Soon after, the veterinarian was murdered. Part of the crime scene was the bloody letter the victim wrote using his blood. He wrote Q, a dying message that the police took to mean Jacqueline's pet. They thought the motive for the murder was because he couldn't save the animal. Adding to the circumstantial evidence was what happened during the funeral. Writings suddenly appeared on the right arm of the wife, which said, Jacqueline murdered me. Jacqueline was almost detained, however, the real culprit surrendered herself to the police. It turned out it was the veterinarian's wife. Her name was Paula, and when she saw her husband's dying message, she knew he was trying to write her initials. So she used mirror writing to implicate Jacqueline. What wasn't made public was that it was Greville who convinced Paula to surrender herself. He had asked Victorique's expertise to solve the crime so Jacqueline wouldn't go to prison. In exchange, Victorique asked him to adopt the pompadour hairstyle forever. Up until the present, only Victorique, Greville and now Cujo know the true circumstances around Greville's hair and Jacqueline's absolution from the crime. After the event, Jacqueline married S.G. Signore, leaving Greville secretly suffering from his heartache. In the present, Jacqueline finally decides to leave the school. A few minutes after she left, Greville arrives with the books, Upon seeing Cujo and Victorique in the garden, he asks the boy to leave him and his sister alone. Once they're in private, Greville remarks about Victorique's intelligence, whom he calls Grey Wolf. But as intellectual as she is, she has no heart and doesn't know love. Back then, when the young Victorique requested the pompadour hairstyle, he thought she wanted him to suffer. She should have said stop loving Jacqueline instead. Victorique looks away, wanting to deny his accusations. It's true that before, she didn't know what love was. She was raised in isolation, and her intellect was prioritized over everything. She wants to say she's changed, but can't find the courage to do so. In the end, Gevel leaves her alone. Jacqueline and her maid have returned the cosmetics to the man. On their way home, she reminisces about the times when she and Greville were younger. They used to have occasional meetings, and she treasures those moments. For her, Greville will always have a special place in her heart as her childhood friend. Soon, 
summer arrives in St. Marguerite. Everyone is looking forward to how they'll spend the holidays. As for Kujo, he doesn't have the option to go home to Japan, as the voyage will take months. But Avril approaches him and invites him to spend the summer in her grandmother's cottage in the Mediterranean. Kujo accepts the invitation and then remembers Victorique. It's clear she'll be the only student in the school during summer vacation. He goes to the library tower to invite her, but as usual, she's being hard, impolite and snarky. Kujo leaves her alone, much to her remorse and regret. When it's time to travel, Avril and Kujo board the train. However, he decides to go back to the school to accompany Victorique. There, he finds her sunbathing beside the huge tree near the dormitories. Although she doesn't show it, Victorique is grateful to have Kujo with her. Their summer may be uneventful, even boring, compared to yacht vacations and cruises done by their classmates, but they find ways to entertain themselves. One activity is the exchange of puzzles between Victorique and Cujo's second oldest brother. Victorique is the first to issue the challenge of solving puzzles. She has previously asked Cujo's brother to rearrange a pony's body parts so that a second horse will appear. Cujo receives the mail along with some summer sweets sent by his sister. The solution is to arrange the pony's feet so that the white space will show the second horse. When there's nothing to do, Cujo climbs the tree while Victorique reads on the grass. He remembers his time in Japan during summer and how it seems that the summer here in Soville is quiet. He realizes there are no chirping cicadas in this foreign country. He also remembers how his father was too strict on him compared to his brothers. The eldest is physically gifted, while the second is an intellectual. Back then, he didn't know what his strength was. He would always find solace in his mother's arms and the company of his sister Ruri. When the opportunity to become an exchange student came, he grabbed it immediately. It was his way to escape. But if there's one thing, his mother commended him on being kind. It's a strength that isn't considered won by many. Summer days pass peacefully. Victorique finally manages to climb the tree. She was so inspired when she first saw Cujo climbing. But because of her pride, she can't bear to ask for help on how to come down. That is a shame, though, because she has missed eating the orange cake that the schoolhouse mother has made. It's Cecil, who is fortunate to sample the sweet dessert. Later that day, summer rain falls. Cujo worries that Victorique may not have figured out how to climb down. He calls her stubborn before offering to catch her if she bravely jumps. Victorique does jump, but she lands on poor Cujo. They both decide to dry themselves inside Victorique's house. There, the girl attempts to prepare tea and cakes and fails spectacularly. In the end, they spend the rest of the day listening to the spattering rain. Then Cujo remembers he received a letter from his second brother. It's another puzzle issued to Victorique. The puzzle is this. Three loggers went to the mountains to bring home three logs. But the logs were too long to be carried by one person. Then, one of them remembered that their lord's instruction was that each man must carry two logs at the same time. The three loggers obeyed, and they successfully brought the logs down the mountain. How did they do it? Victorique easily answers the puzzle in the blink of an eye. She forms a triangle using her thumbs and index fingers, illustrating how the loggers have done it. She says the logs were formed in a triangle, and the loggers stood at each of the corners. Each man held up the end of a log with each of his hands. As usual, Cujo is amazed by how fast she solves it. But Victorique compliments him on how high he can climb trees. Sure, his brothers may be better, but they're not here in the academy. It may be simple and trivial, but it's something Cujo can be proud of. What she's trying to say is, he should have more faith in himself. He may not see his own strength, but other people, especially Victorique, appreciate him. Eventually, the summer rain stops, producing a double rainbow arching over the library tower. It may not be an eventful summer for both of them, but together they can find comfort in climbing trees and the absence of chirping cicadas. Thank you for watching. See you in the next video.